delicious. Good evening. My name is Terry Dukes. I'm the Parent Involvement Coordinator at Thomas County Middle School. Um, I got chosen to be the one to welcome you guys to this, which is our second system-wide workshop for parents. We're very excited to do this. Last year we um, had a workshop on cyber safety for youth and we had a good response. And another topic that always comes up for parents and teachers and just community people request is one on anxiety. So that's why it was chosen as our topic for this year. Um, anxiety is something we all experience from time to time. Right now I'm anxious because I don't like public speaking that much. Um, but our speakers are going to give us some good tips for dealing with it. Um, it's something that we all deal with. It's not something that's isolated to one person, one age, one gender. So we can all benefit from help from our experts. We're very excited to have four experts speak to you tonight. Um, it's not going to be us trying to come up with something. These are people who have practical advice for you. Um, if you have, I hope everyone has a program. These are our speakers. We have Ms. Ferguson of Georgia Pines, Mr. Hart, Dr. Graves, and Dr. DePlantis, which will speak to you. Each one has a topic that they're going to talk to you about, and they're going to share information. After each speaker's presentation, there will be a slide introducing the next speaker to help make the transition easy for us. Um, when your face or your picture comes up, if you'll just move to the podium, we'll begin your presentation. After tonight's presentation, you're going to be asked to complete an evaluation of this workshop. This is important and we ask that everyone participate. Each of your comments and suggestions will be read and used to plan future events. We listen to the topics that you want information about, and that is how we plan our workshops each year. Dr. Dagman will come up at the end and will give you more information about the survey. And now, I'm gonna sit down and let you get the information that you came for. We're going to start with Ms. Ferguson is first. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, that was dry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. Nice to see you all today. My name is Ms. Cassidy. I'm Ms. Ferguson. I am a GAP counselor with Georgia Pines. And today I'm going to be talking about what does anxiety look like. That's me. That's a nice picture. <laughs> okay, so what does anxiety look like, right? So the definition of anxiety is a persistent and an excessive worry um, about a number of different things. Could be school, could be life, could be work, could be family. And what anxiety is characterized as is a daily constant worry or fear or dread. So even if they want to go to school, they dread it. They worry that something's gonna to happen to them, right? And it just starts to become something that interferes with their daily activities. Now, everyone has a little piece of anxiety, right? That actually helps protect us. Like we're worried about how we're gonna pay a bill or worried about driving on the road, about what's gonna happen. It's when it's consistent and it's a constant state of it. Like you can't shake it. So what are some causes of anxiety, right? So researchers have said there has been some genetics, like family, um, family background. So when you come in and do an assessment, they'll ask you, do you have anyone in your family who's ever been diagnosed with anxiety? Brain chemistry, the imbalance in your brain. Like you said, family background again. And lifestyle factors, right? What type of food are you taking in? Are you always taking in junk food? Do you get physical activity? Do you have any medical issues that may be causing you to have anxiety? And social influence. We all know nowadays that social media has a 
plays a big role in our kids' life, right? And sometimes, well, I know for a fact, when I was younger, I'm talking like I'm old, but there wasn't a lot of things that I had access to on the internet. And now you can pretty much see anything. You know when anything is happening, uh, big events, there's, there's nothing that's not on the internet, right? So anxiety looks like a couple different things in different age groups. So I broke it down to preschool and elementary ages, right? Sometimes we say that these kids are the fidgety ones. They're up and down. They constantly say, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom. And even as a teacher, you say, you don't have to go to the bathroom. But it could potentially be a symptom of anxiety. They can say that they're headaches. Um, they don't want to participate in group activities. And sometimes they're easily startled, right? And some of these are similar in high school and middle schoolers, but I think some of the key ones that stand out is definitely the urinating, the tiredness, the trouble falling or staying asleep, the trembling, and definitely the upset stomach, right? You can hear say, mommy, my stomach hurts. I don't know what's going on. You think they haven't gone to the bathroom or they're holding it in, but it could be a symptom of anxiety when it comes to preschool and elementary age kids. So my middle school and high schoolers, those same symptoms could still pertain to them, but with middle school and high schoolers who I work with, um, sometimes it comes with the unrealistic view of your thoughts, right? There are these irrational thoughts that something could potentially happen to them. They're more based on their opinion, not facts, not evidence that can back it up. They may feel edgy or restless, very irritable. Their muscles are always tense and their body is tense. Again, they have trouble falling or staying asleep. They constantly worry, um, difficulty concentrating, and sometimes people get that symptom confused with what we call ADHD. Right? A child has difficulty concentrating, he can't focus in class. Well, it doesn't have to always be ADHD. It could be anxiety and they're worried about the classroom size, they're worried about what's going to happen next, worried about what happened last night, all those different things. And having shortness of breath, right? Kind of that mimics a panic attack, which I'm about to get into next. So, we gave the generalized symptoms of what anxiety is. Now there's different types of anxiety. You have social anxiety. The number one symptom for that is wanting to not be a part of a group or take parts in conversations. These are the kids who are not gonna raise their hands in class. You may ask them a question, they may not answer, right? They fear being humiliated or rejected, so they rather isolate themselves from people. Then we have what we call panic disorder. People start having panic attacks. That's shortness of breath, that's their chest hurting. Um, sometimes people feel nauseated, they sometimes have headaches, and that's the sudden feeling of terror that something's going to happen. And sometimes what they do is take desperate measures to avoid an attack, which means they'll isolate themselves or they'll try to run away from the trigger, and if they don't run away in time, according to their body, then the attack comes. And then last but not least, phobias. Certain places or events or objects might bother them. So me, I don't like clowns. Never have, didn't want one at a birthday party. I don't want to go to McDonald's. I don't want to see Ronald McDonald, none of that, okay? But that is not a phobia. I can still deal with being in contact with them even though I don't want to see them. A phobia would be, I don't like the clown at all. I don't want to see a picture of the clown. I don't want to see a clown's nose. I don't want to see clown makeup, right? And this can also be period to crowds. I don't want to be around big people, big crowds. I don't want to be socially boxed in. And then what happens if you have a, a it's a powerful reaction, a strong irrational fear, right? And then what happens, you begin to get triggered, like I mentioned. And so the different type of things you can do for this, which my lovely speakers will go into, is you can go into talk therapy. Gap therapy is offered in the Thomas County Schools. It's in the school system and on breaks. There can be medication that can also help you. There's also exposure therapy, which actually exposes you to what actually triggers you. And it gradually and slowly but surely can help you deal and cope 
with the anxiety that this may bring you. And that is it for me. All right, good evening. My name is Dusty Hart, and I'm a licensed professional counselor, the founder and director at Kalon Christian Counseling. And I'm thankful to be here with you tonight. I want to uh, thank um, the organizers of this event. I think it's really awesome that we have a community that sponsors events like this. And so I do uh, want to thank Dr. Deckman and uh, also Ms. Kara Hankinson for inviting me to be here tonight with you. I want you to think about many, many, many years ago, before you actually had children, maybe this was the time of your honeymoon years of marriage, and you were thinking about what life would look like when you had kids. And maybe this is the picture that you had in mind. <laughs> this is the Leave it the Beaver family, kind of the perfect picture. You've got the, you know, the kids, sons, daughter, and even the, the family pet. And then... It wasn't too long after you have kids that you realize reality sits in and life looks more like this. <laughs> Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way we think it should, and that's true with parenting. Sometimes our families and our children don't quite turn out the way we think they should. And that's the reality that we all have to face. And one of the things that you know, I want us to think about tonight is what is going on in our society in our culture, in our world, that there's a mental health epidemic. When you look at the research, there are two big things among affluent families. And I would say that Thomas County is a very affluent, and I know not everyone is privileged per se, but they're, we're really blessed people. And if you look at the research, there are two big factors that keep coming up over and over again. Uh, why do we have these mental health issues? Why are we struggling with depression and anxiety at the rates that we do? The two big things that come up over and over again, one is, act, is a achievement pressure, and the second thing is isolation from parents. And so what I want to do tonight in the little bit of time that I have is just be able to encourage you and challenge you at the same time that as a parent, and I'm primarily speaking to parents tonight, you have a vital role in your son or daughter's life. It's critical. And I want to put a little pressure on you, not that you don't have pressure already, but you are the only mom or you're the only dad that your kids have. And if you don't come through in the areas that you're called to, nobody will. And I know you guys are good people, so in some ways I feel like you know, I'm preaching to the choir. But achievement pressure is a real factor that we need to pay attention to. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't appropriately challenge our, our kids by any means. But when we put too much pressure, too much emphasis on achievement, and there's not enough connection. And so this would be the two, kind of the, the big whammy here, when you, you get a combination of both of these. The achievement pressure is there, but there's not enough support. There's not enough connection. And I want to talk a little more about specifics of what that connection looks like. But the achievement pressure would be the parent who we would call like the over-involved parent or the helicopter parent. They're the parent who is really pushing their son or daughter to do well in academics, to do well in sports, to be you know, a certain way behaviorally, if you will. And they're really focusing on that performance thing, but they're not providing enough nurture. They're not providing enough warmth to provide the connection and the environment for that child to succeed. So in some ways, they're setting their son or daughter up for failure. Our kids need a supportive, secure base from where they are going to launch from. So we've got to learn how do we connect with our kids. It's not just loving our kids. We all love our kids. There are specific ways that that looks, and I want to talk about that before I end. I love this quote from Kurt Thompson. He says, we can grow up in homes in which the food finds a table, the money finds the college funds, and the family even finds the church each Sunday. But somehow our hearts remain undiscovered by the two people we most need to know us, our parents. It's not just love in terms of providing things for our kids that our kids need. There's very specific ways that we need to connect to our children. And that's where I want to end with the big five. These are the five things that you have to come through for with your kids if you want to see them resilient, secure, and being able to thrive. The first is attunement. And attunement really has to do 
with that quality where you're able to be present with your son or daughter, that you're not distracted or overly distracted or stressed out yourself. Now that's a challenge in our day and age because we live at such a rapid pace and there's so much pressure on each of us that we're stressed out. So we've got to learn how to tend to our own needs. And that's one of the things I want to challenge you on is making sure that you have healthy habits yourself, that you are aware of how to take care of your own soul so that you can be present and attuned to your child. Vital connection here. So you can imagine if you're a stressed out parent, you're not going to be able to be attuned to your child. So just understand that. You've got to take care of yourself in order to be able to come through for your kids. Attunement. Second, responsiveness. Once you know the needs, you're willing to come alongside. doesn't mean that you're fixing all their problems or taking away their uh, natural consequences of life, but you're willing to come alongside and help out and say, hey, I'm here. I care about what's going on. I love you. How can I help? What support do you need? Third would be engagement. And that is that you're engaging their heart. You're not just focusing on the behavior or the surface things. You're actually looking at what's going on beneath. So with anxiety, for example, you're not just satisfied with saying, okay, well, we have anxiety issues. Let's take them to a counselor and get on some mental health drugs. But you're engaging their heart. What are the fears and the insecurities that they're facing? And you're willing to engage them on a deeper level. Fourthly, you help them regulate negative emotions. Again, there's an assumption here that you yourself can regulate your own emotions. A lot of us didn't grow up learning how to deal with our emotions. So we tend to avoid the negative ones. That's a mistake. We have to be able to accept all of our emotions, both positive and negative. They're all part of the adaptive part of what it means to be human. We've got to be able to engage both. So when it comes to negative emotions, one, we don't shut those down, we're not against those, but we're willing to engage them. We're open to our sons or daughters' distress, stress, whatever they're going through, and we're willing to be empathetic, and I would even say compassionate when it comes to their emotions. So we learn how to engage and also regulate. Now the way we do that, in part, is by staying grounded ourselves. So when our kid is in a crisis, we're not caught up in that. There's not the emotional trigger that happens. Now, you may feel some anxiety, but you're going to choose, and you have coping mechanisms to help you stay grounded. That's regulation. Fifthly, a willingness to repair. This is not about perfect parenting. There are no such things as perfect parents, as you all know. This is the good enough parent. And the good enough parent is willing to admit when they've made mistakes, when they're wrong. And that's the willingness to repair, to say, hey, I screwed up. Will you forgive me? And you're, 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 again, you're modeling for your son or daughter how to repair relationships. And I want to end with that. This is really about connection and disconnection. When we're talking about a society that's filled with depression and anxiety, it's a disconnected generation. It's a disconnected world. Now, I understand technologically we're totally connected. But the reality is we're more disconnected and isolated in America than we ever have been. And there's lots of evidence to talk about what that is. I don't have the time to go into that. But I want to end with this need for connection. And I'm going to leave you with an article. Um, can I pass that out? Sure. Okay. You can put it on your table if you like. Yeah, I can put it in the back if you'll grab that on your way out. Um, it will help add to what I've already shared with you. Connection is key. If you want your son or daughter to feel secure, to be able to thrive, you're going to have to make sure that they feel connected and that they're supported in these very specific ways. Thank you for letting me share. Right, well, thank you, Dusty, for presenting these, these big ideas, these, uh, I would call it the foundation of what parents can do. That, that without connection, none of the nitty gritty things that I'm about to present will work at all. Um, Basically, if we're all just working on instinct and not thinking through things, then none of it's going to work. But what I'm going to be doing tonight is basically talking about some really concrete steps for how to teach your child, how to walk your child through some anxiety. And this is very brief. Pretty much each of my slides I would normally spend an entire one hour session going over with a family. So um, know that, that 
all of this is just kind of briefly scratching the surface, but giving you hopefully some ideas of where to go. And I have a handout that's at the front that also has some book suggestions if you want to read more into any of these skills. Um, there I am. Um, oh, I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm a clinical child psychologist. I've been practicing in a private practice in this area for over 10 years now. Uh, I direct the South Georgia Autism Center, um, and that's the contact information for the office. But. Um, okay, so one of the ways that I like to describe anxiety to children is that it's a false alarm. As everyone has been saying, anxiety is just a part of life. We all feel it. But when it works correctly, it gives us an alarm at the right time. So we know how to respond to it. We respond to it appropriately. Oops. Uh -oh. There we go. That's the correct use of anxiety. There's a fire. The alarm sounds, we leave. Perfect. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, but it, what, when our anxiety system gets too sensitive, when it gets too overreactive, we start running away from just a smoking oven. Okay? And then it can spread further. This is when it truly becomes a diagnosis. That it's not just normal anxiety or worry, but it's starting to spread. And now an alarm is triggered when you're doing homework, when you're talking to another person, or even just walking into a room. And the level of anxiety here is the same as it is here, but this is no longer a helpful alarm because there's not actually a fire anymore. But it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like a small alarm. It feels as though there really is a fire and if you don't get away from this worry immediately, you are going to be consumed. So sometimes when our children worry about things, it it's very easy to be like, oh my gosh, really? You're worried about this? Come on. But to them, it really does feel like this. So in order to help them, oh, sorry, this is what happens when it, it takes over. And I'm sure you know, maybe we've all been through these times where the anxiety truly just takes over the entire life. And when you have an anxious child in your home, their anxiety takes over the whole family. So, one of the first steps is let's just turn down the volume of this alarm. Let's make it so that everyone can think clearly or a little bit more clearly. Um, because one of, the, one of the bad things about anxiety is that it really shuts down the ability to think. Because if there's truly a fire, you don't need to think about what is the best route for getting out of here and the strategy would be this and where did it even come from? No, you just need to get out of the building. And so anxiety shuts down your ability to think. But if you're anxious all the time, then you're never thinking clearly. So the very first thing you have to do is let's just calm down this. And you use your body to calm down your brain. The body and the brain are very connected. We like to think of them as separate. <laughs> but if our brain are, has gotten taken over by the worry, the best way to calm down the brain is actually to hijack it through the body. And so, deep breathing, stretching, pay attention to what's around you, um, pace, distract yourself. I don't like public speaking either, so right before I knew I had to talk, I got up, I went to the bathroom, I got some water. Just doing something rather than just sitting there thinking, uh, oh my gosh, there's more people here than I thought, <laughs> it helped. And once I got over that hump, now I'm fine. Uh, but an, an important thing to know is that if you wait to do this stuff until the alarm is like at a level 10, it's not gonna work very good. <laughs> like, and if you, wait to get on your bike ever. The first time you get on your bike is when you're trying to get away from an angry dog. You're not gonna get very far. But if you practice riding your bike every single day, when you need it to get away from the angry dog, it'll work great. So deep breathing, a lot of kids tell me, they tell me to deep breathe and it doesn't work. Because you haven't practiced it. It's not automatic for your body. 
So for it to really work well, it has to become part of a practice. Um, okay, so now you really look at the anxiety. There's a lot of times anxiety turns into this big black cloud, this fuzzy future. And most of us are just like, I just, I'm worried something will happen to my kids. Okay, what will happen? Well, I don't know. Maybe they'll get sick. Well, what do you mean? I don't know. I don't know. Cancer. Well, how often, you know, and, and the more you talk about it, the more it's like, oh, okay. Actually, that is something I can cope with. But, like, let's say your child is worried about something. If you argue the anxiety, you tell them, this math test isn't that big of a deal. The milestones tests are not that big of a deal. What's the automatic response? Yeah, it is, Mom. You don't get it. We argue back. It's, it's our natural response. So instead of doing that, you do the opposite for your child. You ask your child, what's the truth about the milestones? What's the truth about how you did on the milestones last year? Oh, you passed. That's right. What about the year before? Oh, you passed that one, too. So what's the truth about this year's milestones? Right you'll probably pass this one. That way they are affirming to themselves that they have the ability to cope. And then what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, when you're anxious, you don't want to think about that worst thing. But a lot of times when you actually look at it, oh, right, a math test isn't going to kill me. And then from that, you help them develop the plan, or this coping phrase that I've got this. I've done hard things. I can do this one too. I survived last year's milestones. I'll survive this one. Um, I've done new schools before. Uh, in, in the county school system, that's one of the nice things is you practice going to new schools all the time. So by the time you're new in middle school, <laughs> you can tell your kids, remember when you started Garrison? Remember how you thought it would be terrible? Was it terrible? And they'll go, no. Remember, what did you like about Garrison? Well, this and that. Okay, now what about Cross Creek? Was it terrible? Did you have friends? Yes, I had friends. So what do you think middle school is going to be like? And then they could say, well, I guess it won't be so bad. Um, and, then, and then you have them start repeat it. I, I, did, I, I got used to Garrison. I'll get used to the county schools. I mean, the middle school. I got used to... And then another sort of very practical step is to just avoid unnecessary alarms. Um, so if your child is anxious walking into the school building, prepare so that the morning at home isn't so stressful. Um, I don't know about you guys, but every single morning my children seem to forget how to get ready. Like, come on, shoes. Huh? Shoes, sweetheart. Put on your... Oh, like when have they ever not had to put on shoes? <laughs> but I have found that if we make their lunches, if they make their lunches ahead of time and we put out the outfits, it really does go way better. Um, and talking about connection, especially with my little ones, if they spend a little bit of time on my lap at the very morning, beginning of the morning, the morning goes better. Um, <clears throat> Remove unhelpful influences, social media, especially for the girls, as much as you can. Consider limiting it. I was talking about get out of your comfort zone a little bit, do something that you know is going to be good for you, and connect with um, like-minded people. Um, it also produces that buffer to stress, so your body's used to overcoming challenges, physical challenges, and you're in a position um, to continue to do that. Um, so, when you are not used to exercise and physical activity, um, you want to start slow. You want to have like, hey, I got this and my body's in the right kind of shape to, you know, enjoy it. <laughs> when I first go to the gym, it might not seem that enjoyable the first go round, but give yourself some time, pat yourself on the back, keep going back, um, and you'll be amazed at how much you can improve.
Um, the next tip is nutrition, and I know some of our other presenters mentioned that, but um, we all know that we're supposed to eat healthy foods, um, but people who are suffering with anxiety, there's a lot of research out there that way in your favor in terms of trying to combat anxiety. So limiting your processed food and your added sugars, like we said, because um, we're, we're wanting to keep our gut lining healthy. Um, eat your balanced diet, um, lots of water. Uh, you want to limit caffeine or alcohol because those are known to heighten uh, your anxiety responses. Um, and then you want to choose foods that are antioxidant rich. So I'm going to give you um, a couple of food items here, but again, I'll have that list outside. But this is um, from a 2010 study that kind of looked at what are the most antioxidant rich foods. Um, so beans, fruits like apples and plums, cherries, um, other berries, nuts, and vegetables, um, and then there are certain spices like ginger and turmeric that are known to have a lot of antioxidant properties, so those can definitely help you as well. Then we have other feel-good foods. Um, these are foods that are high in magnesium. Research has shown that it helps create a calming effect on the body. So um, foods like leafy greens, spinach, and chard have a lot of magnesium in them. Foods that are rich in zinc, um, oysters, cashews, um, beef, egg yolks. So, you know, foods that we know and that we eat, um, but they can really help us out there. Um, foods that have omega 3 so fatty fish like salmon. Um, asparagus, this one was interesting to me. Um, asparagus is known to be a healthy food, um, but in um, China, it has uh, so many good properties that they actually take asparagus extract and they sell it and put it into um, to other food items um, that we're seeing the connection between probiotics and anxiety. So um, in a journal in the psychiatric research, they suggested that there was a link there um, between probiotics and lowering social anxiety. So probiotic rich foods are things like pickles, sauerkraut, and kefir, and those um, reduce some symptoms there. So um, my, I make my kids take a probiotic in the morning, along with a little gummy vitamin or something, you know, not only so that they won't get sick, but um, there's so many firsthand anecdotal stories of probiotics being linked to um, depression, you know, anxiety reduction and symptoms. Um, and then food sensitivities, being aware of things that might trigger you. For some people, you know, gluten, dairy, um, certain food items that you might have a sensitivity to can definitely increase the way that your body uh, responds. It can create more inflammation, and so we want to be real careful um, and pay attention to some of those. And there's great tools out there to track your food, log your food, and see, hey, did I feel differently when I ate this or when I pulled this food item out? Um, because food can really make a difference in how we fuel our body. Um, the next one, bedroom. We're not going in there to hang out and play on our phone and do our homework. You want it to kind of be a sanctuary retreat. You know that you're going in there to sleep. Um, if you don't go, if you go to bed and try to go to sleep and you don't fall asleep within about 15 or 20 minutes, I suggest you get up, leave your room, get a change of scenery, and then try again later. You don't want to just be hanging out in your room going, I wish I could go to sleep. Um, you want your mind to understand that when I come in here, this is time for me to go to bed. Um, as we mentioned earlier, exercise is great for you and regular exercise can help you sleep better. You just want to make sure that you're not maybe exercising right before you go to bed, get your heart rate and everything up and going, then it's kind of hard for your body to settle back down. But exercise definitely can promote good sleep patterns. Um, getting outdoors is huge. If you can get out and see the sunlight for about 30 minutes a day, that exposure to daylight helps set our sleep patterns that our bodies um, naturally fall into that rhythm. Um, so get outside, see the sunlight a little bit every day. Um, avoid looking at the clock. There's nothing worse than when I can't sleep and I just see my alarm clock looking at me and I'm counting down the minutes. So turn it away. <laughs> turn it off. I, the alarm's going to get me up, I promise, but I don't need to keep checking the clock throughout the night. Um, and if you're still having problems, 
you can seek help, talk to a, a professional because there are different herbal remedies um, and other routes that you can take um, if you're really in a funk and, and can't get good sleep. And then the last one, um, some of my peers mentioned um, some of these strategies as well. Having um, a healthy attitude. As we all know, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of anxiety can be a good thing. It can bring out the best in us. Um, but when it's interfering with your daily life um, and you're inhibited from doing the things that you used to do, that you enjoy doing, that you want to do, that's when it becomes a problem. So um, what are some attitudes that you can take to help you um, when you're starting to feel anxious? Uh, well, the first one is accept that I can't control any, everything. Um, you know, Paul's put things into perspective. Is it really as bad as I think? And I like how you talked about finding the truth and what was really going on there. Um, do the best you can. Understand that we are not going to be perfect. Perfection is not attainable. So applaud yourself. Um, you know, pat on the back. I'm giving it my best effort. Be proud of that. Um, replace your negative thoughts with positive ones. Um, and like Dr. Graves mentioned, <laughs> don't wait until you're in really struggling to track, practice this. This is something that is a good thing to say every day. Give yourself some positive affirmations there. Um, and then the last one is to get spiritual. Um, however you really want to define spirituality. Um, but spiritual people generally feel more hopeful. They're open to new ways to handling anxiety and depression. Their attitudes and behaviorals, excuse me, behaviorals, behaviors, there, I got it out, uh, naturally evolve in a positive direction. And the way that you see the problem, your perceptions um, generally change in people with a spiritual outlook. Um, so some concrete actions that people can take to improve their mental health. Um, practicing tolerance, acceptance, kindness, and service to others kind of gets us out of our own mindset. It helps us to realize that there are opportunities even in difficult situations and that we can find gratitude in all circumstances. And people who can kind of see the world in that way have a significant mental health advantage and they tend to be more creative, happy, and productive. So um, changing that mind shift and talking to yourself early and on and frequently can really set you up um, to battle anxiety that might head your way. So those are my tips from a health and wellness perspective. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Beckman. Uh, thank you so much for being here this evening. Please uh, offer another round of applause for our delightful presenters.